Or think about, think about child labor. Child labor has been ubiquitous throughout history. Some of you may have heard me talk about child labor before. I won't dwell on it. But people say that child labor is a fruit of capitalism. Capitalism yielded you child labor. Because before you had capitalism, the kids were just skipping through meadows all day, whistling a tune. And then capitalism came along, and they had to go work in a coal mine and get their limbs blown off. That's not so. I mean, children have worked since the beginning of time. And the reason they've worked is not that they have terrible parents. And th this is a, this a profound lack of curiosity when you hear modern Westerners talk about child labor. They know they're against it, right? And they're going to make sure we know that they're against something everybody hates. Super brave. <laughs> they're going to tell us how against it they are, but they never bother to stop and wonder, what is the root cause? Even if you don't, these are the same people who say we need to consider the root causes of crime. And they say, just because I'm looking into the root causes of crime doesn't mean I'm excusing crime. Well, likewise, doesn't mean that you're embracing child labor to at least try to investigate why it is so ubiquitous. Why does it exist? I mean, isn't, aren't you at least curious why, why it exists? And the answer is because without it, families in poor countries starve to death. That's why. And you hear that, and suddenly you think, oh my gosh, I've been such a fool my whole life. That's so obvious. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the International Labor Organization, which is not exactly a laissez-faire outfit, said in a report about 20 years ago, this is from their report, poverty emerges as the most compelling reason why children work. Poor households need the money, and children commonly contribute around 20 to 25 percent of family income. Since by definition poor households spend the bulk of their income on food, it is clear that the income provided by working children is critical to their survival. Hmm. So there are two ways you could approach the child labor question. You could say, well, if a lack of food and a lack of labor productivity, in other words, if you know, maybe their parents work could produce more, then the children wouldn't also have to work. Maybe we could work on that, get the parents' labor to be more productive. Then they could produce enough stuff to have the purchasing power to buy more food, to buy more things. The kids won't have to work. Or you could just say, let's pass a law against this. And unfortunately, there are enough low IQ people in the world that they go for the second one. Let's pass a law against the kids working. We just learned that the kids are working because the family will starve if they don't. So let's ban them from doing it. That's not the best way to go about it. And Oxfam actually did a study of what happened when Bangladesh tried to get rid of child labor. Answer, the children starved to death or went into prostitution, which is exactly what all the libertarians tried to say at the time, but none of the do-gooders could manage to fit into their busy schedules five minutes to think about that. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, the not that we celebrate child labor. We've got to understand if you want to get rid of it, you've got to understand what's, why is it there. And what's gotten rid of it has been the market economy because it makes your labor more physically productive. My father, those of you who are on my email list um, may have read today, I, today's actually my, would have been my father's 67th birthday. And he was a, a forklift operator in a food warehouse for 15 years. And that was not fun work. Uh, this, it's humid and hot. It's just extremely unpleasant, but because he had a forklift, he was able to be, I don't know, a hundred times more productive than he could have been with his bare hands. Imagine the weight of these pallets that he's driving around. There's no way he could do that with his bare hands, and certainly how's he going to stack them that high without a forklift? It can't even be done. That allows him to command greater purchasing power in his wage, and basically meant that I didn't have to work. I could sit around like a bum reading books all day, which is what I did. <laughs> so that's what got rid of it. It's not, yeah, they passed laws against it after it was 90% gotten rid of already. But if you just pass the law and you don't create the fertile ground whereby people can become more physically productive in their labor and thereby liberate their children from work, all you're doing is guaranteeing starvation. The logic of this is, not, is beyond debate. Can't debate this. That's, that's the fact. But I bring this up because today, of course, we have less child labor than ever. Reason to celebrate. So we have the case of children working. We have the case of people being so poor, they had to hibernate. 
Well, then, if I may return to, and here I'll um, read a brief passage from a transcript of my discussion with Professor McCloskey. Uh, it proceeded like this. Uh, even in a country as rich as France in the middle of the 19th century, people were very poor. I estimate that world income around 1800 was, in modern terms, $3 a day. Imagine trying to live on the cost of a quart, of, a quart or two of milk spread over all your consumption, all your housing, your clothing, your education, everything. $3 a day is a terrible, terrible life. Now, the world average adjusting for inflation today is $33 a day. It's about what Brazil is now. $3 a day to $30 a day, even if you include very poor countries like Chad and Bangladesh, is an enormous increase. It's a factor of 10. And in countries like Sweden, the United States, Australia, Hong Kong, the average is over $100 a day. So it's either a factor of 10 for the world per capita, or it's a factor of over 30 for the countries that have really absorbed the ideas of liberalism in the classical sense. Here's the most important point. The average poor person in the world is better off by a factor of 10 than that person was in 1800. And in the countries that have allowed capitalism to flourish, like Sweden, and she says, which is a highly capitalist country for all we've heard of its socialism, again, it's a factor of 30. The equality of real comfort, having a roof over your head, having a serious education, having smallpox vaccination or the elimination of smallpox, having enough food to eat, these comforts, which were denied 90% of the people in 1800, are now enjoyed by ordinary folk. Even the poorest in a rich society are vastly better off in material terms than they once were. So this engine has been so much more productive in improving the condition of the poor than any of the schemes of equalization of incomes. Now you would think we would pause to appreciate this. This is astonishing. And yet, not only do we not appreciate it, it's not well, present company accepted, we love it, but no one else knows about it. I don't mean that they're unhappy, they don't know. It's not reported. In classrooms, nobody learns this. In the newspapers, nobody learns this. And how do I know that nobody learns this? Is this just a dramatic remark that I'm making? Actually, they did a study of it not too long ago. Um, the late Hans Rosling's web project, Gapminder, did a survey of people in 14 different countries. They asked 12,000 people spread over 14 countries the following multiple choice question. Do you believe that the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty over the past 20 years has A, doubled, B, stayed roughly the same, or C, been cut in half? Well, the answer, as you know, is that it's been cut in half. 95% of Americans got that question wrong. They don't even know. I mean, imagine being that ignorant about what must be one of the most momentous achievements in all of world economic history. It's happening all around you. You don't even know it. That's amazing. And that's because somebody somewhere with the responsibility to convey this information to us is ungrateful, is demanding more, is impatient, is always critical of capitalism and can't give it credit for anything. In the early 1800s, 45% of all children died before age five. That's now 4%. In 1800, people living in what economists call extreme poverty, you're talking 90%. It's under 10% today. Oh, they'll say, if they do acknowledge this because you force them to, they'll say, oh, that's because of redistribution. Governments are responsible for that. All right, here's why that's wrong. <laughs> where did the increased social spending, where did the increase in the welfare state take place? That took place in the rich countries where they had already gotten rid of extreme poverty. The poverty reduction took place in the poor countries that can't afford a welfare state. That's the answer. The poverty reduction happened in the places where there wasn't an increase in the welfare state. Extreme poverty was gone 
from the Western world long before there was a welfare state. Other statistics, since 1960, literacy is up 43.6%, caloric intake up by 688, 20, over 21 years of life expectancy, and three inches in height. Now you realize that's just an average, it doesn't apply to every individual. <laughs> I happen to be scrolling through, just the other day, humanprogress.org, and I assembled the following headlines almost at random. Here are some headlines. 75% of sub-Saharan Africa now has access to clean drinking water. French family becomes first to move into fully 3D printed home. Infant mortality in Asia has fallen by 74% since 1969. App lets you be a blind person's eyes from anywhere in the world. Since 1970, the global rate of child mortality fell from 13 to 3.1 percent. No, we are not running out of forests. This device can turn desert air into drinkable water. Technology helps those with dementia live independently. Every village in India now has electricity. These are headlines I just took at random. So, my point. We see what, we have a, the slightest inkling of what life used to be like. It's a, 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 almost inconceivable for most of us. You think about how little clothing you had, you probably didn't have shoes. Uh, good luck if you need dental work. You could go on and on and on. Do, do you think that you were able to join a book club with your friends? when nobody had books and people were one bad harvest away from starvation? Do you think they had square dancing conventions? Do you think they had bird watching societies? Do you think they had any of this? That's what life used to be like. And we know what it's like now. It's not to say there aren't any problems, but we live lives that are straight out of science fiction. And it's an interesting exercise to just go through your life and just take a day where you just notice everything you're doing. And if you were to try to describe it to Thomas Jefferson, he would think you'd lost your mind about all the magical devices that are serving you all day long and all the food that's available to you. Just think about the food that's available to you. You think about some monarch in European history would have all these different dishes prepared and then decide which one looked good and eat that one. Okay, you can go to a supermarket with far, far more choices than that and pick out anything you want and go eat it. I mean... The, we could go on and on about the differences. But here's my point. Can you imagine if you lived in Burgundy in, let's say, 1800, and you were with one of those people hibernating, and somebody then described to you the explosion in material comforts, and not just material comforts, but in the spiritual renewal that occurs when people aren't living hand-to-mouth all the time and can fulfill those aspects of what truly make us human. Could you imagine being told what life is going to be like someday and thinking to yourself, yeah, but when we get there, if there are people who have more than I do, I'm going to be really ticked off. <laughs> I mean, you would have to be deranged. You'd have to be deranged for this world to be described to you and for you to be saying, yeah, but you know what, somebody, that, you know that magical vehicle that's going to drive me around with a magical device that tells me how to get where I'm going? Somebody else might have a bigger one. <laughs> you're a terrible person, <laughs> if that's the way you think. That, you're a terrible person. There's probably no hope for you. But you guys are young enough that I can, you know, we're going to try and just stop that from taking root here. We can stop it from, from starting, but once it starts, it's hard to make an ungrateful person grateful. These are ungrateful people. Yes, I know there's plenty of injustice in the world still, and I want to fight against all that injustice. But the fact is, the market economy has made possible miracles no one could have dreamed of and the response from socialists is to get out a bullhorn and go scream at their employers? That's a deranged, sick, ungrateful individual. So, that, so we, we're not like that because we pause to stop and appreciate and be thankful for the things we have. 